Thank you uh, for being this afternoon here with us. Uh, my name is Gonzalo Castro de la Mata. I'm the chairman of the inspection panel here at the World Bank. And this afternoon, we will be releasing the fourth report in our series on emerging lessons. This report on consultation, participation, and disclosure of information. Previously, we have released reports on involuntary resettlement, indigenous peoples, and environmental assessment. And the idea is to have a record of the lesson from panel cases, 25 years of panel cases, and to contribute to institutional learning in this way. Before I go any further, let me introduce the extraordinary panel we have today to discuss the report. Starting from my right, Kristalina Georgieva is the CEO of the World Bank since January of this year. Previously, Kristalina spent several years with the European Commission, first as Commissioner for International Cooperation, Humanitarian Aid, and Crisis Response, and later as Vice President for Budget and Human Resources. Before that, Kristalina had a distinguished career here at the bank, where she held senior positions between 1993 and the year 2010. Welcome, Kristalina. Thank you. We also have Mr. Jason Alford. Jason is Executive, executive Director at the Board of Directors of the World Bank, where he represents Australia, Cambodia, Korea, Mongolia, New Zealand, and 10 Pacific Island countries. Before becoming an Executive Director at the Board, Jason served as Alternate Director for the same constituency between 2014 and 2016. Previously, Jason served with the Australian Treasury and as an economic advisor in the finance ministries of Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. Welcome. And we also have Abby Maxman, the newest president and CEO of Oxfam America. Abby brings more than 25 years of experience in international humanitarian relief and development to her new post. Before Oxfam, Abby was the Deputy Secretary General of Care International in Geneva, as well as Vice President of International Programs and Operations. She has also worked with the US Peace Corps and several other international development agencies. Welcome, Abby. So our program today is very simple. We're going to watch a five-minute video that introduces the report, where our Executive Secretary, Dylan Barlas, will be making the presentation in the video. After that, we will have a brief conversation with the panel, and then we will take questions from you. So if we could have the video, please. The World Bank Inspection Panel is pleased to release its fourth report in its Emerging Lessons series. The new report uh, involves cases where the complainants have alleged that the World Bank did not follow its policies on consultation, participation, and disclosure of information. 30 of the 34 cases the panel has investigated involve these issues. The report identifies five lessons from those cases. Lesson one, identifying all relevant stakeholders and engaging with appropriate representative is crucial to establishing meaningful consultation and participation. When consulting with indigenous peoples in particular, it's important to consider the cultural complexities of communities and to engage with their different segments, including women, elders, and youth. Lesson two, disclosing all critical project-related information, including on potential risk and impacts, in a timely and accessible manner is the foundation for ensuring effective and meaningful participation. Stakeholders should be provided with an adequate amount of time to review the information shared to ensure that worthwhile consultations on project design can be conducted. Lesson three, timely and accessible consultations that utilize culturally appropriate communication tools and give due consideration to the local context are essential. Starting consultations early in the project cycle enables stakeholders to provide insights into both the project design and the identification of environmental and social risks and impacts. Lesson four, consultation and participation should be continuous. Foster two-way communication and adequately respond to feedback 
from affected communities. The panel's experience has shown that renewed consultations with updated information are particularly needed when circumstances change, such as in the case of long delays during implementation or modifications in the project design. And lesson five, considering the objectives of the different consultation requirements under the World Bank safeguard policies is important. Fulfilling the purpose of consultations throughout the project cycle requires a different level of engagement under each safeguard policy, environmental assessment, indigenous peoples, physical cultural resources, and in voluntary resettlement. These five lessons can be identified in several panel cases, including the investigation into the Albania power sector generation and restructuring project. In that case, the panel found there was no record of any attempt to proactively engage the relevant stakeholders. Consultations took place only after key project decisions were made. And even when the consultations did occur, there was neither adequate notification to project-affected people nor proper disclosure of project documents prior to those meetings. Indeed, the panel's almost 25 years of experience has shown that consultation can serve as a tool to empower affected people and communities to participate in the development process and to integrate their voices into projects that affect their lives. Thank you very much. Very good. We will go now then with some opening statements from our panel and we'll hear the views from bank management, from the bank's board, and from civil society. But we'll start with ladies first, so Cristalina, why don't you go first, please? Well, thank you, thank you very much, and uh, my apologies for being uh, a bit late. I was chairing a session on refugees in uh, Lebanon and Jordan, uh, but also as an old professor, I know that a meeting like this has to start 10 minutes later, so it can end 10 <laughs> minutes earlier. This is what we used to say to our students. On a serious note, um, um, I, I got to work on environment in the 70s because of the passion I felt for environment, but also because of a very uh, sad uh, story in my family. One of uh, my relatives, got very seriously ill because of uh, heavy metals poisoning of groundwater. Illness that is completely avoidable if we knew, if there was access to information, if what was known was disclosed to the public. And that had a tremendous impact on the way I think of access to information and the value I attach in my role in the institution to making sure that people are engaged in decisions that affect their lives, they are empowered to influence these decisions, they are informed about the consequences and should something be done not the way it is, it is supposed to be done, there, there is an avenue for redress. Uh, our institution, I'm proud of the World Bank, we have gone a long way, sometimes uh, more enthusiastically, sometimes we were dragged for our hairs, but we have gone a long way to be a good institution, a caring institution, in one that, that values the, the uh, role we have to give access to people, especially those that are marginalized, excluded, give, allow their voices to be heard in the high corridors of power. So what we do is quite aligned with the lessons that are described in this report. Uh, and actually, I would add one step further, and it is to be as proactive as possible to build in our programs projects that are based on participation and inclusion. Uh, 
I was uh, meeting with a group of uh, uh, civil society representatives from developing countries. I don't know whether any of, of them are in the audience. I don't see anybody. Okay, so, so here, somebody is waving a hand over there. And I was telling them uh, about a project that became the mother of a whole family of projects in this regard, and that is the Ketchumatan develop Development Project in Indonesia. In the uh, uh, late 90s, uh, we had the East Asia crisis. There were tremendous problems in Indonesia, and at the same time, a government that at that time didn't have a lot of credibility for managing transparently public money. And we were faced with this dilemma, how to be helping people, but at the same time making sure money goes to the best uh, possible need. So a very smart guy, his name is Scott Guggenheim. He's an anthropologist. Uh, anybody here remembering Scott? OK, so here we go. Scott, at that time, created this concept of block grants to communities against three conditions. One, that c the community itself decides what are their priorities, and that the men and the women of this community are the decision makers. Two, that we give the money to the uh, community, but in the middle of the, of the village, there would be a big white board, and on the board we would write what the money is for, how much it is, and who is responsible. And then three, we would have this incredible team of supervisors, young boys, sometimes girls, on uh, motorbikes, and they would travel from community to community, and the thing they would supervise is, is the board there, and is the information accurate, nothing else. We don't measure the roads, we don't uh, count uh, uh, construction, because people are empowered and they supervise extremely well. So the short and the long of what I'm saying is that, that it is paramount for success in development to reach out to those for whom programs and projects are designed. And as you say in your report, do it early, do it repetitively. Listen carefully to what we learn and be able to reflect it in the design of the project at any stage, to be also there when implementation takes uh, place. Uh, so on behalf of my colleagues here in the bank, I want to thank you for the work you have done. As always, as, as always in prudent relations, there are some parts in your report that we have some um, difference in views, but on the broad message, we are 100% with you. And you can count on us taking it forward. And you also can count on us thinking of this as a living uh, 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 document uh, and thinking about ways in which we can enhance the engagement, especially with, in the world of new technologies. One thing I was surprised not to see in your report was a little bit more emphasis on that. How can we use this? wonderful new world of uh, everything being seen by everybody everywhere and communicated fast, how we can use it uh, for, for the purpose of uh, consultation, participation, uh, and use of information. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Kristalina. Thank you very much for those words. Now we turn to Avi. <clears throat> Avi, what can you share with us from your experience with, with CARE and, and now with Oxfam? Thank you. Well, it's really great to be here and to be part of the rollout of the report because, as Kristalina was saying, some of these lessons are not new. And what is new is this effort to pull together and capture the learnings that can become a showcase and a model for all actors, the bank, member countries, financial institutions, and civil society. Oxfam's ability to deliver on our goals and objectives is long hinged on supporting and empowering local and national civil society organizations. We work with partners at all levels because we're convinced with our 75 years of experience that has proven this, 
that this is the most effective strategy to achieve lasting change. So why we're doing consultation, participation, and disclosure is really key to effective outcomes. We know that these issues related to this are not easy to get right, and they need to be continuously tended to for ongoing improvement. In order for them to be truly effective, development institutions, including ourselves, must appreciate the value of and show our full commitment to them ongoing through the full project cycle. They can't be seen as boxes to check, to check off or compliance forms to be filled. As the panel report states, the panel's cases show that meaningful consultation processes are a key factor in successful development projects. And experience shows that to do so, they have to be genuinely seen by practitioners as foundational elements of good, sustainable development and good governance and the principles of good governance that you highlight. Participation, accountability, transparency, and inclusion. They are the processes that help ensure a project's true success, maximum benefit to those who need it most, and minimum harm particularly for those already vulnerable or marginalized populations, be they indigenous peoples, women, persons with disabilities, or others. And when these processes are not seen or practiced in this light, they are not as effective and outcomes are poorer. My view is that it's always the right time to have this conversation. And at a time when the bank is paving its future path, there are at least two important reasons that make this conversation all the more relevant and welcomed today. First, as the bank aims to become a more agile, efficient, and adaptive institution, it has to put in the processes to learn, adapt, and remain accountable. Such an approach then demands that transparency and participation is strengthened even further. After all, an adaptive management approach is, truly, is only as good and effective as its feedback mechanism is. So the question becomes, what constitutes good enough feedback mechanism? And it starts with timely, accessible, and easily understandable information, which is a precondition for meaningful engagement. And that engagement, as already been said, needs to be inclusive gender responsive and sustained throughout the project cycle. Through that engagement, we need to be responsive and accountable to do something with the information that comes in, be it positive or negative. That commitment needs to be a sine qua non from the outset, not as an afterthought. And the second reason this conversation is particularly timely is the bank's ambition to increase its interventions and to be effective and fragile and conflict-affected states. In such context, it is essential to ensure that participation processes are safe from intimidation, discrimination, or fear of reprisals. This is particularly critical given the increasing restrictions on civil society space that we're experiencing and witnessing in many countries. According to the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law, more than 156 laws and other restrictions constraining freedoms of association and assembly were reported to have been passed in 75 countries since 2012. Meanwhile, Global Witness reports that 2016 was the worst year on record for killings of land, forest, and environmental defenders. 200 people were killed across 24 countries. Shrinking space is not theoretical. We have the evidence and we must adapt our processes accordingly. I ask that we step back and acknowledge the humanity in all of this. The panel report lays out an example of displaced communities in West Africa not having adequate information to meaningfully discuss, discuss their own livelihoods options when being resettled. Few of us can imagine what it would be like to be uprooted from our lands and homes, let alone not having every detail of our resettlement options. Development for whom is a question we need to keep asking ourselves. Development is about people. Let's make sure they are an integral part of the process. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Avi. Now we would like to hear uh, from Jason, perhaps a perspective from the board, or anything else you want to share with us. <laughs> or as an individual, no, from the board. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's probably no accident the board is sat between management and civil society, so that's often <laughs> the, the tension. Um, so like, like uh, Crystalina and Abby, I think um, you know, the bank's in the business of opportunity, and it's only a short step from, from opportunity to, to thinking that consultation, participation, and inclusiveness has to be a, an important part of creating opportunity. I think the board really values the inspection panel and the role it plays in that regard. Uh, and this is particularly so in the context of the, the new safeguards that we've, we've uh, completed last year or the year before and had been working on for, for some time. Development is inherently a risky business and safeguards help us to manage those risks. The safeguards, of course, have an intrinsic value. Uh, but they also have a value in helping us to maintain stakeholder goodwill, both on the borrowing countries for what they can expect from working with the World Bank and our shareholder countries in terms of the standards that they expect us to, to uphold. And I see the, board, the inspection panel is helping us on, on two main fronts. One, on discrete projects, of course, they, they help us to assess problems as they occur and to work, help the bank work on appropriate responses to those problems. But on the systemic end, I think uh, from the inspection panel's work, we have an opportunity to learn from uh, the um, types of problems that come up and to use that information to do things better. And I think this report, which is I think the fourth report in this series, Gonzalo, uh, is really important in helping us learn those broader lessons and to do things, to do things better. Um, it's about prevention rather than cure, I guess, is the, the simple way to say it. No one wants a safeguards breach. I don't think our borrowing countries ever want a, a safeguards breach, uh, and certainly the bank doesn't want that. So I think the recommendations in this report are very welcome. As Abby said, a lot of them, when you read them, uh, seem to be self-evident. They're things that you thought you knew, uh, but it still is important to put them down, and it's, it's things that the inspection panel has seen that we've had problems with, so it's worth thinking about why. Um, but to step back to my general point, even though these recommendations come out of discrete uh, projects and relate to discrete projects, I also see them as having as being very valuable at, uh, to think about in terms of our uh, country diagnostic and country partnership framework processes. They're becoming a much more important part of the way that we plan our uh, country engagements and, and our programs. Uh, they're, they're an opportunity to under, uncover risks in our program and to think about how to manage those risks, including by testing uh, country resolve to helping us manage those risks in the programs. And I think you know, as Abby said, the, the scope for community consultations and civil society involvement around the world has been narrowing quite a lot. And I think in that context, thinking about these recommendations at that abstract level of the country program, the World Bank does have an opportunity and a capacity to convene diverse groups, even within those narrowing laws, and to show the value of consultation to our, to our member countries and to get a better, a better program as a result that, um, importantly, uh, gets a higher level of borrower commitment to the program and willingness uh, to, to help us manage the risks in those programs. Very good. Thank you so much, Jason. So we have consensus. This is very important. Consultation is critical for development. But let me ask one question to the panel now. Um, challenges. What are the barriers? What are the challenges for effective consultation and participation? Let's follow the same order. Cristalina, please. Well, the, uh, the first and very... Uh, uh, obvious to anybody who has worked in uh, development is that we have a, an important task and usually on a tight, tight timetable. And more often than not, it is happening in uh, fragile environments, in, in complicated, difficult environments. And then you have a team that is striving to get the definition of what needs to be done, how it has to be done, by what uh, time and at what cost. And that in that process uh, is engaging in consultation. The very first risk is that it could be perceived as a one stop in the journey and then the journey continues. And then you go check, done, and that may be done early, it may be done well, but circumstances might change, or maybe some groups 
are later on to be affected, but they were not included. So what we need to face that challenge is really for our teams to feel empowered to correct themselves. And that I found in many occasions is, uh, is a message that has to penetrate actually from top to bottom. That it is okay if you are to make a change. It is okay to revisit uh, your concept. It is not a, a weakness, it is actually strength. Uh, and I, and I, I, to all of my colleagues in the audience, I would, I would say, please do it. We got from the board a very important uh, delegation for restructuring. Uh, and that I am very grateful to the board for, because it allows teams to feel more comfortable when a project is approved and they need to restructure. And certainly that is a good moment to also engage and consult. Uh, so that, that, that is one. Two is, uh, to, be, to be very uh, frank, the fact that we have been um, um, institutionalizing so much in terms of uh, demands. Uh, the policies are great. Uh, they actually are there for a reason, and the reason has proven to be one that enhances development objectives. But as any big organization, we have managed to then create the guidance notes and this and that and the other that overwhelms people. Uh, we are now going to move to the new environmental and uh, social framework. We just had a discussion on the um, uh, guidance, guidance notes. We are still working on them, so hopefully they would be tighter by the time they arrive uh, to the general public. But I'll tell you, the volume that we had, I was uh, only half joking with a colleague walking out of the room saying, you know, I hit you with this on the head, you're dead. So we, we, do, we do have to figure out how to be um, comprehensive and inclusive and at the same time not overburdening and not bureaucratic. And that is not an easy task, I can, I can, I can tell you. Let me stop here for now and then we can come back to Very good. Thank you, lessons Christalina. we have learned. <laughs> Thank you, Cristalina. Avi, the same question, challenges, yeah. barriers? Thanks. Well, I've uh, already highlighted and I'm going to emphasize the challenge of shrinking civic space because it's not to be understated. I think creating the enabling environment and the role that the bank and, and other institutions and power holders have in creating that space is of critical importance. Uh, we know that speaking out and engaging and hearing voices at the community level is something that people are afraid to do at times. And so the effort that needs to be made mm -hmm. to ensure that the safe space is made needs to be sincere, that genuine commitment to creating the space for consultation, participation, and disclosure. At Oxfam, we integrate these approaches into what we do and also into our global campaigns, uh, focusing on fiscal transparency, fair taxation, inequality reduction, and extractive industries. And the bank has such a huge opportunity to set the tone and the expectations of how we uphold social norms mm. and create the expectation that consultation mm. is a requirement, it's essential. And actually, that notion of uh, successful outcomes at the end are really premised on assuring a, an appropriate non-bureaucratic consultation and consultative process. Could I just, I, I, I'm sorry, uh, Jason, if I could just add one more thing, uh, because uh, uh, I think we, we have to be uh, aware of it. And it is the fact that uh, our pool of staff are specialists in all kinds of disciplines. And uh, some of them are very competent engineers, very competent economists, very competent, competent transport uh, specialists, who happen to be kind of competent in their area. Uh, some of them introvert, 
and we are asking them to do things that are not actually in their comfort zone. Uh, we, have, we are very lucky we have a president who is anthropologist. So it's easy <laughs> for him. And uh, uh, you guys have me. And I am an extreme extrovert, so it's easy for me. But we need to, we need to always keep in mind that, that there is a human factor and that sometimes we have to balance teams in a way that allow for this to be, to be a meaningful and inclusive process and that we also find the resources, I'm looking at the board, we have to find the resources to support people, to train people, to give them the skills mm -hmm. that, that, is, that would make it easier because engaging and consulting is a trainable skill. Mm -hmm. But being smart and competent task team uh, leader not necessarily equates to having that skill up front. Thank you, Kristalina. Avi, uh, were you done with your comments? So we'll go to Jason then in terms of uh, challenges and barriers. Uh, so I'll try to be quick because I think my comments are very similar to Kristalina's from the context of the countries I represent. And uh, for context, the smallest country that I represent has a population of 10,000 people sitting out in the middle of the Pacific. So mm. these, are, these are small countries. In the context of the safeguards, again, we made a couple of important changes. We, sh we shifted approach from uh, I guess something more akin to the checkbox approach that Abby and Kristalina were talking about on safeguards, doing it up front and trying to make sure everything was right before you start, to one where we try to monitor compliance against the safeguards all the way through. And I think that's, that's obviously a, a sensible change to make, mm -hmm. but it is difficult and it is uh, resource intensive. The other thing we did was to put more responsibility on our borrowers to make sure that we're meeting those safeguards. And again, from the context of the countries I represent, very small countries, uh, and the same for the push into fragile and conflict affected countries. Sometimes we rely on countries that don't have very developed institutions and don't have the setup to be able to monitor that very well. So that's new risks. And I think what we need to do is to give them the incentive to look for where projects might be going wrong. Um, and, and how do we do that? The incentive if you're the country owner or, or even the World Bank TTL is to look at your project and to see it doing good. It's, it's harder to look for where things might be going wrong. So I think the incentive to look for where we can improve, but also the practical tools that help you to deal with that, uh, to help you to find that and to help you to deal with it if you do spot it. So 200 pages worth of, of guidance doesn't really help. It's practical frameworks, practical tools that help you engage with your partner country in a way that's culturally and socially acceptable that allows you to cut through and to, to build up the um, constituency to get the change that you think needs to be made to make the project better, and it's difficult. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jason. I, I have several questions here, but um, these are too easy. Why don't we go now to the floor and, and hear from you the questions. Please come to the mic, and uh, if you could just briefly state your name, and if there is if you're asking to everybody or just a specific person, please mention that as well. And please keep your questions short. Well, thank you for that guideline about asking questions. And I appreciate what all three of you had to say. And I've been hearing it for the last beginning of my career. You can say my name is Dr. Jyotsna Bapat. I'm an anthropologist. And I'm affiliated with a non-governmental organization back in India. And uh, this has been a question which has been on my head. What is it that is non-negotiable as far as the development projects are concerned when it comes down to World Bank? Because as far as I know, there are development projects, there's a checklist of what projects get approved, and so on and so forth. And then you have the development objectives, the agenda for development. And as far as I know, as an anthropologist, there have been societies which have been dealing with these issues. It's not like something mm. which has not happened. Every society manage, every community manages their water resources. Mm -hmm. They manage their forests. They manage to make sure that their wildlife is safe and so on and so forth. And some of them survive. Some of their practices don't survive. So. When you're talking of a new strategy on part of the World Bank, what is it that is non-negotiable? And what is it that you're willing to give forth as far as the project goes to the community? If the community is as efficient as at managing in a different way, are there only one path or are there multiple paths to achieving that goal? 
-hmm. I hope I've made my question clear. Yes, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Let's try to take another question, if there is one. Please come to the mic. Um, good afternoon. My name is Abdurrahman Al Mahdi. I'm from Sudan. Um, and thanks f to the inspection panel for this um, report. Um, and I think, like uh, Abi mentioned, I think this is what's new, that the panel is doing reports like that. So I commend that. Um, my question is about um, when I come to Washington and I hear about these reports and we read them, they sound great. And guidelines and glossy documents. And when I go back home, to the field and meet with the um, res reps, the country directors, it's another totally different story. So my question is, I think, to Kristalina, is how can you um, here at the headquarters level really make sure that some of your country directors and people on the ground really take these recommendations and these issues down and start translating them into action? And we would love to, as civil society also, maybe give you some ideas on how that could be done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's take one more here, gentlemen, and then we'll go to the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mukunda, Mukunda Julius from Uganda. I, I just have one question. Oh, but, but first of all, of course, to, to thank the, the panelists. What, uh, what powers do you have to enforce your recommendations? Because if something goes wrong, maybe in Uganda or another country, you go there, do the, the, the consultations, you know, an outcome comes, and probably want to change something. What powers do you have to enforce it? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So let's go to the panel now. We have three questions. Who wants to take them first? Kristalina, you want to start, please? Let me, let me start. I think they are mostly uh, for you. <laughs> I, yeah. How would the uh, inspection panel enforce by the power of persuasion of something that, as we heard from, from the panel actually, is commonsensical and it makes development better. And by, uh, by the fact that the panel knelt me to be here in front of you, it becomes uh, a, uh, a very visible, and actually I, on a serious note, the reason I prioritize to be here with the panel today is to send this very clear message that we as management recognize the, the uh, value of these recommendations and we recognize they're good for our work. Again, we always in, in discussions with the panel, we reach a space of agreement and there are some elements where we see it differently, but that is not important. Uh, what is important is that the broad message we accept and we endorse. Uh, on the a point from Sudan, how do we make sure that what is being discussed here translates into behavior in the field? Well, the first part of my answer is by having you here mm -hmm. and by having access to information, disclosure, and also ability to communicate concerns and mechanisms for redress. We have built a system that not one part, but the system in its totality, makes it so that we respect our promise to people in developing countries that we are there to hear you and do what is necessary to be in a meaningful service to development. And of course, if you have specific observations, please do share, it, share them. We would take them, of course, uh, on their face value. We would see how that fits in, in the uh, total picture, but we would take it very seriously. The second part of my, my answer is uh, we actually have internally, not by the mechanisms, not, by, not just by the inspection panel, but we have internally management tools to make sure that we check on whether what is agreed at the corporate, le corporate level is being implemented. And one of the checks in our system is a, a vice presidency that has a horizontal corporate 
uh, role. Uh, it is our uh, policies uh, vice presidency, and actually the vice president is right here. Manuela, you can stand up. Uh, Manuela Ferro, her team is for us a very important part of our internal mechanism to make sure that commitments that are being made are also being uh, implemented and followed. Does it mean that we 100% are always doing what we have committed to do? Well, broadly, yes, but of course, as the inspection panel cases would show, there are occasionally uh, moments in our work where we could have done better, we could have seen further, we could have been uh, more, more effective. But one thing I want to say to, to, to our friend here from Sudan and to everybody in the audience, one thing that I am convinced in is that in the World Bank, we do have, I mean, this is not your grandfather's World Bank. It is an institution that itself is very diverse. It is quite inclusive. We argue a lot with that among ourselves on, on development uh, issues. And we try to be where the problems are. We move towards fragile states, even if it is risky and harder. Uh, and we try to learn from our experience, including from our mistakes. Maybe I should leave uh, Jason to answer the non-negotiable since I took so much space uh, so far. Jason, please, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, thank you. You want to yeah. give <laughs> it back. No, no, uh, in the spot. <laughs> I can, I can, I can yeah, uh, keep going. I, I think I'm, I'm not sure I quite got the question on non-negotiables, but perhaps taking a couple of angles on that. So one, uh, so I've been talking about safeguards. I guess if you look at the safeguards, uh, where I started was saying development's an inherently risky activity. You have uncertainty about whether your intervention will have uh, the outcome that you want in terms of the development success. You also have uncertainty because of the nature of your, what you're doing about whether things will go wrong around the kinds of things Gonzalo looks at, like resettlement, for instance, or Indigenous peoples' issues or consultation or, or whatever. And the process that we went through around the safeguards, I think, was to think about uh, the taxonomy of risks and to think about which risks we find completely unacceptable and we want to try to build into the system uh, safeguards that stop them from happening entirely and other uh, things that we uh, we manage the risks. For instance, in terms of the economic outcomes from projects, one way to manage that risk is to have a portfolio of projects and you know some will succeed and some won't, but that's a risk you can manage. Uh, so I guess the, the safeguards help us help us with that. In terms of, you were speaking about local communities and the non-negotiables as well and the experience the communities have in managing their resources. I guess that's exactly what we're talking about today, that the, the bank's projects can always benefit from that engagement with local communities and understanding of um, the, the processes that they have to manage resources which have been built up over presumably a long period of time and probably take into account things that as an outsider are very difficult to diagnose quickly. So I think that's the, that's the benefit of the, the consultation process. But really we're interested in, as I said, opportunity. We're interested in outcomes. So as far as possible, we should be open to doing things differently if, if our engagement with the community shows us a, a better way to achieve what we want to achieve. Can I just say one? Uh very important non-negotiable, that our money is not stolen, abused, mismanaged. So we have a set of judiciary responsibilities that are really non-negotiable. Thank you, Christina. Abby, please. Well, I'll just reaffirm one of these questions. The, a theme to these questions are about how do we all hold ourselves accountable to enacting behaviors consistent with the lessons we continue to learn over several decades of work. and how we model the expectation as leadership from headquarters to country programs is, is critically important. And also, as you're saying, there's so much data that shows that outcomes are better. You can make the business case for uh, practicing the good practice, and you can also, there's the do the right thing and doing things right, and of course, it's the right thing to do. We know this by experience as well. So I think as all actors in, in 
from civil society to continuously holding ourselves accountable. At Oxfam, we sign up to the INGO Accountability Charter, Charter Accountable Now and other spaces as one of the mechanisms we use to make sure we're modeling behaviors and ensuring our practices about complaints and compliance and disclosures. And I think we have an obligation and a responsibility in the community to continuously hold this up and do these kind of things. Thank you so much. Um, let's take two more questions. Very brief, please, because I know uh, you have to go to the next engagements, all of you. So, yes, two questions. Very brief, please. Go ahead. Brief question, but probably long answer. Uh, my name is Dr. Mindy Reiser. I'm vice president of an NGO called Global Peace Services USA. I think we need to take this discussion one step back. We've been talking about the responsibilities of management and staff throughout the world in country offices and headquarters. But we need to think about the countries that are incurring the obligations to the World Bank. Yep. What you're talking about here is critical, but it's delicate and it is dangerous for some countries. Abby herself talked about the shrinkage of space for civil society and opposition. And I'd like to hear briefly what you think you can do in your various roles to convince countries that have to be somewhat dragged, kicking and screaming to accept the consultation, to accept difference, to accept dissent. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much. One more question, please. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Leonardo Semperti. I'm an energy consultant. A question that is more or less related with the previous one. Uh, what about transparency? And this, is, this may be a question directly directed more to the inspection panel itself. Uh, I'm thinking about the, the, the governments and the recommendations that can be useful for governments. We know that in some cases, states don't want to uh, even have consultation processes. And in some cases, too, communities are advised by entities that are no saints. Communities have their own struggles for power, and it's, it's a confusing process, to say the least. So uh, how, how much publicity can uh, improve these processes? Should these processes be publicly disclosed on live and in direct time to all the population of a country, maybe? What, what, what could you advise about that? OK, thank you so much. So maybe two minutes each, and then we're going to have to close very soon. Cristalina, yeah. would you? Uh, well, on the, um, um, I, I grew up on the other side of the Iron Curtain in, in, um, in Bulgaria. And uh, my country was quite non-disclosing and inclusive. And uh, when, uh, uh, for example, Chernobyl happened uh, with qu quite serious implications for us, uh, we only, those of us who spoke some English, found out from BBC. It was not on our TV. It was not on radio. So what happened to this system of oppression? It went bankrupt. Part of the reason it went bankrupt was because it was repressing the skills and capabilities of its people. Uh, I, so there is a historical lesson there to be, to be learned. Does it mean that everywhere in the world uh, things are moving in the right direction? Of, of course not. Uh, what can we do? Take the long-term uh, long view. Stay engaged, build capacity, be, build it when you can. I have not seen one single place on this planet when everybody in government is corrupt and non-reliable. Build this, build the, build what you can, where you can, do as much as possible, push the envelope. And long term, hopefully, uh, we would see what happened in my part of the world, a massive transformation to an open society. Thank you, Kristalina. Jason, would you like to go now? Sure. Um, the, that's a couple of really tough questions. Um, and for me, I represent a couple of countries. I won't name them in case I get sacked, but a couple of, a couple of countries that really are quite new democracies and just don't have the frameworks that we would see in, uh, around us in the US or a country that's been working on its democratic frameworks for hundreds of years. And that leads to, to weaknesses and difficulties. And we, at some point, confront a threshold question of whether we can best serve the population of that country by being engaged and within the limits mm -hmm. of the frameworks that we confront, pushing the envelope and getting the consultations and doing the development work, or whether the risks and complications are so great that we decide we can't deal with that and we have to, we have to step back. On balance, relative to my colleagues on the board, I would probably be at the end of saying we should stay engaged and look 
to get the development outcomes where we can, to do the consultation where we can, uh, to build up the skills of the population, that eventually things will change. But I recognise that there are different views on this uh, and it is very complicated. For what it's worth, for one of the countries that I represent that I just mentioned, where we're going back into the World Bank uh, for the country economic note for that country in very difficult circumstances, did an extraordinary consultation process that was incredibly valuable for the program that we, that we hope to implement there. Mm. Thank you, Jason. Abby? Well, I'll uh, emphasize a point where I do think that influential international institutions have an obligation and a responsibility to hold governments to account for upholding global norms, principles, and opening civic space. It's very important that we use those global platforms and work in alliances and civil society and working together and collaboratively to ensure voices are not exposed disproportionately individually to some of the repercussions or uh, punitive aspects of dissent being a dissenting voice. But it's not easy. It's not risk-free. And that's where I think institutions such as the bank have a very important uh, role to play to help push the boundaries and the expectations on global norms and, and principles. Thank you so much. And I am afraid that we have reached the end of this session. It feels like uh, we need much, much more time to keep consulting and disclosing and, converse, and the conversation going. But I really want to thank the three panelists. And Cristalina, thank you so much. You represent management. And I appreciate you being here because um, uh, I, I, I think that we have been able to, to build a very constructive uh, relation of mutual respect, even though we are independent from bank management. For, thank you. Jason, thank you so much. On, on your behalf of, to the Board of Directors for all the support that you provide to the work of the panel. And Abby, thank you so much, civil society, for keeping us honest. Thank you, thank you so much for everybody. Thank you. Thank you.